Well, well, thank you. Uh, so today I prepared a little bit more than the talk on Monday, so uh, you now get the cool slide of uh, who I am. So I'm Emmanuel Seemann. This is the pronunciation, so don't, uh, in English, uh, it's a bit uh, sketchy sometimes. I'm 25. Uh, I come from Zurich, and I'm going to return to Zurich uh, at the end of the talk. Um, I'm a mathematician. I did mostly geometry and combinatorics. And now at some point you have to realize that you have to earn money and then geometry and combinatorics doesn't pay much. Uh, so I'm a now a data scientist uh, at CrowdSec and I've been doing this for about one year. So, show of hands, uh, who here uses Home Assistant? Okay, that's uh, surprisingly few people. It's just, it's a tool you can use to basically hook up your Raspberry Pi to any type of uh, smart light, smart fridge, uh, smart whatever in your home. It's great. Uh, of those people, uh, who here has used the Bayesian sensor? Yeah, that, that was expected. So on the, on the <laughs> home assistant side, this is a in-core home assistant and it's used by 193 people, uh, which is a bit sad because it's a great tool. Uh, and maybe if you go home and the four people and pay attention, uh, then you can use it at home, thanks to my talk. Uh, for the other guys, uh, I'm sorry, I have nothing to offer to you, I guess. <laughs> so today uh, we have uh, two stories. We have one is uh, email spam. I will move this out. Uh, email spam nostalgia. And the second story is uh, CrowdSec for the cool hack new people. Initially, this was uh, CrowdSec for dummies, but you all here aren't dummies, so... Uh, you are cool people. And then we do like, uh, we put on our, uh, earrings and then do some Goku fusion. And then we get the third topic, which is this patient bucket that I want to talk about. So the, the first two, they will have a little bit, uh, less uh, context with each other, but we will do some nice fusion to get them together. So the first thing, uh, throwback to email spam. So email spam detection is a very old pr problem and it initially was a hard problem because you had to automatically analyze uh, text data, which is a bit complicated. And it, you had to be very cheap uh, at inference uh, because uh, servers weren't so powerful. Most of it run on the machine itself. So the email client uh, would implement uh, detection for this. And it was generally complicated. But for humans, it's not complicated. You can look at an email and say, ah, oh, this is spam. So let's look at some emails here. So we have only terms uh, of the emails. Um, if you look at single words, we can guess whether email is spam. So the first one is uh, marketing, meeting, transfer. It's okay. It's probably an email from marketing. The second one is prints, uh, transfer, 100,000. Okay. This might be spam, right? The third one is baby happy prints. Uh, this is probably Paige from marketing who, who got her baby. Uh, congratulations, but uh, it's shouldn't end up in the spam folder. And the fourth one is uh, 100,000 uh, severance, uh, sorry, uh, which is a mail you don't want to receive, but uh, you still don't want to see it in the spam. So as humans, uh, we somehow have context uh, on these words. Um, when they appear alone, like the word transfer, right? It appears in the first email and in the second email. Alone, it's not really a clear indicator that something might be spam. But if you see these words together, um, then yeah, it might be a spam email. So Bayesian inference, in some sense, it translates this intuition that we have about uh, these words uh, into a mathematical process that can then be calculated by the computer. So careful, there's some maths ahead, but it's not complicated. You all can do multiplication, right? Okay, yeah. So. There's just going to be some terms uh, that we use to confuse uh, people who don't use math all the time. Uh, so we just introduce them here. So definitions. Uh, the P of A is the probability of event A. Now event A, you can think of it here as uh, the email contains the word $100,000, right? And then P of not A is uh, the probability of the event not A. So the email does not contain the word uh, $100,000. And then this is the most complicated one that we see today. Okay, if you get this, it's great. Uh, you already won it again. So this is P A given B. So that is the probability of event A given that event B has happened. So for email spam, no, let's look at some other example. So you are in, uh, in uh, 
in the streets and the street is wet, right? So the, the event uh, B is uh, the street is wet. And now you want to know the probability that it is raining, right? Then knowing that the street is wet might give you a very good hint <laughs> that uh, it is raining. Now, it's not a 100% hint because you might be in Paris and uh, some, some guy might have, you know, that's why the street is wet, but it, it's a good hint. So uh, to formalize this for email, so A is the email is spam and B is the email contains the word prints. Then P A given B is the probability that the email is spam if we know that it contains the word prints. And now Bayesian inference, big word, is uh, the process of computing this value P A given B. Okay. So now this looks uh, even worse. Okay. Uh, so the, the idea is we can iteratively compute this. So if we have multiple words that we look for, then we can uh, go through a process, this patient inference process, to cal calculate basically the uh, probability that something is spam, given that we know it contains prints, it contains $100,000, and it contains the word transfer. Okay, this is the, the third thing here. And you can see the iterative process behind it. So we have some three variables. We come to that later. Uh, that compute is fourth value. And then we insert it into a similar formula. And then we again compute uh, some multiplication and division, easy notation. And then uh, again, insert it here. This is the iterative process. Yes. This slide you don't need to get to get this talk. It's just there. So you know. Okay. So TLDR, patient inference is a process for improving our predictions every time we see new information. So if we see a new word contained in the email, we can say, ah, yeah, it's, it's now gotten sketchier or it's gotten less sketchy. Okay. So second story is now coming up. So this is a, a big basic, uh, tutorial on how CrowdSec works. So we have a security engine that is open source. We collect uh, reports uh, from IPs, and then we distribute block lists based on these IPs that we see. I'm a data scientist together with Mathieu. We work on the distribution part, uh, figuring out which IPs to distribute. Now today, what we're looking at is actually part of the security engine, part of the detection process itself. So how does CrowdSec work? So CrowdSec reads logs parses them into events, and then fills these events, which is the internal format, into uh, leaky buckets. Now, leaky bucket is an algorithm we use to detect a whole bunch of, of different behaviors. And uh, so I'm going to present you how it works. So a leaky bucket is <laughs> a bucket, yeah, and it collects events. And if uh, the capacity of the bucket is exceeded, it will overflow, and this generates an alert. And it is leaky, so over time, events will leak from the bucket. So what this, for instance, can be used for is when you have a password boot force, right? Some guy is trying, and every time he fails a login, it goes into the bucket. And if he fails too many logins in a too short amount of time, uh, he goes to jail. Okay. So we go through this and it's in nice pictures. So this is a leaky bucket. It has a leak speed of two and a capacity of three. You can see these three. So at T0, some event comes in, we fill it. At T1, some event comes in, it, we fill it. At T2, there's the leak. So one event goes out. Now it still has uh, two uh, capacity left. And now at uh, time three, we have two more events. Uh, now the bucket is really full. And at time four, we see another event and now it overflows. Now we have our uh, alert. Okay. So these are configured in uh, scenario.yaml files. <laughs> you can imagine what this one does. This is a SH brute force. So it looks at the logs. Uh, for failed authorization. It has a leak speed of 10, a capacity of 5. Uh, these are all open source. You can find them uh, in our hub. Uh, there's a lot of behaviors, right? Um, now we can do this fusion part. So you understand how CrowdSec works. You understand uh, you are basically experts in, in Bayesian inference at this point. And uh, now we do some abstraction. So essentially, a leaky bucket is a black box that eats events and then outputs a overflows. So there's stuff coming in and then it does some magic in this black box and then it gives us an overflow or not, right? If the guy eventually succeeds with the password, we don't need to overflow. So what if 
we replaced the internal magic <laughs> with Bayesian inference. So we pour these events in, and internally, instead of counting events, we do some Bayesian updates. So we do this Bayesian inference process, and then we produce overflows. So we can plug and play uh, this machine. So how does this work? So every time an event enters the bucket, we calculate the Bayesian update based on this event. So we have some new information. Uh, it's not the email contains uh, prints, but it might be, ah, uh, this guy uh, does not have JavaScript enabled. Okay, By itself, it's not big of an issue, but if there's other things wrong with him as well, he might be a threat. And then at the end, we look at the probability we have um, calculated, and if it reaches over some threshold we have defined, then we overflow the bucket and create the alert. So the use case um, is that this is not for fighting exploits. It's used for fighting fraud, scalpers, and scammers. So automated bots that are a bit harder to catch, that try to do some evasion, are a very good target for this. If you have a clear-cut indicator of attack, you know, log4j, it requests uh, this specific parameter, um, then don't use a uh, Bayesian bucket. Is it? Use leaky, use trigger, which is basically the leaky bucket without capacity. Instead, it works very well. So we did a case study of this in e-commerce. So we had a client. Um, they provided us with some data. Sadly, it's uh, on the NDA, so I cannot do a demo. Uh, but I can present some insights of, of how we used it. So this e-commerce company, they have a web store and uh, they sell stuff. And you can imagine that they don't sell uh, this uh, stuff that I put on the slide, but some of these things are rare. Okay, so it's like a Raspberry 4, it's like a NVIDIA GPU. And the attackers, they run bots to catch the products the moment they come up. And uh, boring bots uh, can already be captured by a leaky. So if you so see some guy frantically refreshing uh, the NVIDIA GPU page, yeah, at some point you can put it in a bucket and he goes to jail. Um, but the bots, they evolve over time, so they try to do some evasion, they try to imitate real users, and, and so on and so forth. And for this uh, Bayesian uh, bucket, it was a very good idea. So um, what we figured out along the way is that uh, so the customer is German, but they have an English site as well. So the URL actually exposes the language. So if you have <laughs> some, uh, some URLs to products, so in this case... Uh, the is uh, German, right? And then products, and then your Raspberry Pi with a GPU attached. And then you have the option of an English uh, and the same product. Then we can actually look, uh, try to, uh, using regex, to slice out uh, the, the language. And what we figured out was most of the abuse was actually coming over the English side. And very few users were using the German side. Uh, very few attackers. So this is something where Bayesian inference is very good, because... Again, similar to the word prints, right? There are very few emails where it's probably legitimate in a business context to uh, have the word prints, but they still are. But on the other side, there are uh, the, the, the baseline uh, is much higher if the email uh, contains prints. And uh, this is a good uh, rule to do for a Bayesian event that we can update on. Similarly, uh, we can check whether JavaScript is enabled or not. We checked whether the customer looks at many different products, right? Do we see a number of different URLs, or is it just doing the same five URLs and then does do something else and then the same five URLs again? Or whether the customer starts a search within the first three requests. Usually, people, uh, they come to the page, um, and there are some users that just, you know, click the categories all the way down. Or there's others that land on the landing page, start a search, find their product, and go on. And this is very normal user behavior, but it's not normal bot behavior. So we use stuff like this to uh, catch, basically, bots uh, trying to attack their site. And uh, again, this is the power of, of this uh, Bayesian inference system, is that none of these conditions alone are suspicious. The guy might have no script enabled, so he does not have JavaScript. Okay, it's not a problem by itself. But if there is many different type of behaviors that all sum together in some sense, uh, then we get a clearer picture that this person might be a bot. So how to use it for yourself? 
because that's what you're all here for after this. So uh, what you can do is you get some logs and some labels. So you get some IPs where you say, okay, this is clearly a bot. Uh, and then you look at your logs for the whole day, basically, because you need some non-bot uh, IPs as well. You estimate the Bayesian parameters. We'll come to that. Um, and then you configure the scenario YAML. You do whatever, and then you profit because uh, you no longer have bot traffic on your site. The bucket is in general availability on the most recent CrowdSec release. So the configuration. So back to the formula. Uh, it's the last time I show it, I think. Uh, you need to have these parameters, basically, to configure. So what P of A is the probability that it's a bot. Um, so this is what we call the prior. This is uh, the base estimation of it. And then we have the probability that we get a user with JavaScript disabled. And then this uh, is the probability that the user has uh, JavaScript disabled, given that we know he is a bot. And we have this because we have the labels, right? And then you define the overflow threshold, which is it's not this value, but it's related to this value. So I colored it in the same thing. So this all goes into this wonderful scenario YAML, which does not look complicated at all, of course. Um, but there's basically conditions that you look for, and then you have the Bayesian uh, priors uh, for these conditions. Now, to estimate these parameters, there's some work in progress territory. So not all of this might work. So one way to, to get these numbers is you can look at your logs and count. <laughs> so when you Google this, this is called uh, <laughs> maximum likelihood estimation. Don't Google it. Uh, it's a very uh, well-used technique, but uh, people don't want to under want you to understand it in simple uh, terms. I feel like whenever I check it out. So what you can do is you just count. Okay, you have your number of IPs, and then you have your condition, and then you look at the number of IPs satisfying the condition. You divide those by the number of uh, evil IPs you have. This is a probability. You put this in the parameter. It's actually your best estimate that you have, unless you do some very, very fancy stats. On the same uh, slide, uh, the prop given Benin, okay, it's the same thing. You look at all the IPs that are not bots, and then you see how many of those satisfy the condition. You divide by the number of those you have in total. This is your best estimate. Use this. It's good. Um, to calculate the prior, so the uh, thing in the beginning is you just divide the number of evil IPs by the number of total IPs. Again, this is your best estimate, use it. So what you can also do is there is an automated training tool that I'm building. Uh, general availability next week, it uses some Python Go bindings, and I figured out they delete the readme every time I uh, generate them, so it's quite annoying, so I haven't uh, released it yet. Um, you can find that at GitHub. Or there's a third option. So let's wonder again at this uh, Bayesian sensor. There's over 100,000 Home Assistant users, right? And only 200 of those um, <laughs> use this uh, Bayesian integration. And uh, I wonder why this is so low. So maybe the people who are comfortable with this math and the people who use Home Assistant, it's uh, a very small intersection, right? And very likely, people who are comfortable with math and cybersecurity professionals, such as uh, you in this room, also have a similar intersection. So what I offer you uh, today exclusively is you can contact me uh, and uh, send me an email. If you have a use case uh, for this uh, and uh, an idea and uh, some logs, I'm willing to sign NDAs. Uh, I do the whole process because I'm building this as we get along. And it's much more uh, simple for me to build it with feedback from actual users who are trying, who don't have this uh, background that I have, uh, than it is to do it uh, in a black box room. So yeah, if you have a use case for this, if you have some logs, contact me, write them an email. I'm very happy uh, to answer you all. Thank you. Questions? I don't think there are questions for this. They're all scared. Oh, oh there is one question. Um, did you also compare it with um, other approaches next to base, and why? Why did you like focus on base because of the simplicity and the speed? 
Okay. It's, it's simple and uh, there's a lot of, so we can link to the Home Assistant documentation because they have good documentation. We have the same implementation. And it's also, uh, there's a cost question to it. So within the engine, you know, it builds a bucket for every IP, right, that you see. And if we have a very complicated <laughs> uh, kind of model in there, it's, it just gets very expensive on your security stack. And you don't use a security stack that just hawks your resources, yeah. Okay, so a big thank you to uh, Emmanuel for being a Swiss clockwork and catching up time. Yeah. <laughs>